Welcome everyone. We're just, we're gonna get started in just a couple minutes. We're letting everybody get in, into the session. I wanna welcome you to a very special Martin Luther King Day conversation on the film Shared Legacies, presented collaboratively by the Jewish Museum and Film at Lincoln Center's annual New York Jewish Film Festival in Marlene Myers and JCC Manhattan's Cinematters New York Social Justice Film Festival. I'm Cheryl Parker, director of the JCC's Joseph Stern Center for Social Responsibility. And over the next 45 minutes to an hour, we'll be discussing the film's themes, the legacy of black Jewish partnership in the civil rights movement, its connection to the activism that has happened since then, and how the lessons of the past might help us to chart a path forward. You'll be hearing from an incredible panel this afternoon. And we also want to hear from all of you. So if you have questions for the panelists during the session, please put them into the chat box. And if your question is selected, someone from the festival team will contact you and we will unmute your mic so you can ask the question live. Thanks so much to all of our Cinematters partners. And in particular for this session, the Jewish Community Relations Council of New York and the Jewish Museum and Film at Lincoln Center's annual New York Jewish Film Festival. And now it gives me great pleasure to introduce Aviva Weintraub, director of the New York Jewish Film Festival. Aviva. Thank you so much, Cheryl. I want to express my thanks to the Marlene Meyerson JCC Manhattan it's been wonderful to work together with Isaac Zablocki, you, Cheryl Parker, uh, Karima B. Partin on the presentation of Shared Legacies, a very, very powerful film that we're honored to include in our lineup. And a warm welcome and deep, deep thanks to Dr. Sherry Rogers, director of Shared Legacies, and all of the distinguished guest speakers today. I'm pleased to now turn things over to Rabbi Michael Miller, Executive Vice President and CEO of the Jewish Community Relations Council of New York, who will share a few personal reflections and introduce the panel. Thank you very, very much, Aviva. Thank you, Cheryl, as well. And how fitting it is that we gather on the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Day to have a conversation about the relationship between Blacks and Jews. All the more, the viewing of shared legacies brilliantly documents and provides extraordinarily thorough contextualization to the discussion of what was the African-American Jewish Civil Rights Alliance of the past and where we are today. I'm humbled to be included in the film. I was a teenager during the mid 60s and vividly recall how the movement impacted on me. Yes, a cousin and I had a singing and guitar folk song duo, and we regularly harmonized over the movement's melodies, including Oh Freedom, referenced by Clarence Jones in the film. I also clearly remember my late father, who was an Orthodox rabbi in the Bronx, speaking passionately and glowingly at the Shabbat table about a young Yeshiva University ordained Hillel rabbi from UC Berkeley, who had gone down to Selma, Alabama to risk his life and volunteer with voter registration of African Americans. That was Rabbi Saul Berman, who was in the film. And my father, as chairman of the American Conference on Soviet Jury in the early stages of the Soviet Jury movement in the US, invited Dr. King to address Jewish leaders in a telephone hookup to 32 communities across the country on the plight and struggle of the Jews in Russia. That speech was also referenced in the film. My father introduced Dr. King and the recording of Dr. King's speech begins with the words in his sonorous voice, thank you kindly, Rabbi Miller. I've never forgotten those words, nor the uplifting message he delivered regarding the interdependence and interrelatedness of mankind, how Jewish history and culture are a part of everyone's heritage, whether he be Jewish, Christian, or Muslim, let us continue to make our voices heard and our righteous protests felt. And he ended, those that sit at rest while others take pains are tender turtles and by their quiet with disgrace. We are here today to make our voices heard, not as tender turtles. 
the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., his life and his legacy had a profound impact on me and my career and on all of us. So let's begin the conversation. We're privileged today to be joined by three distinguished panelists and our moderator. Dr. Shari Rogers, who so skillfully served as director of Share Legacies, her brainchild. Professor Susanna Heschel, the Eli Black Professor of Jewish Studies at Dartmouth and the daughter of the late Rabbi Dr. Abraham Joshua Heschel, Dr. King's dear friend. And my dear friend and brother, Reverend Jacques-André de Graff, inspirational preacher, advocate, and activist, and our moderator, Yolanda Savage Narva, Director for Racial Equity, Diversity, and Inclusion at the Union for Reform Judaism. Yolanda? Thank you so much. Rabbi Miller for such a great introduction. And it is, it is a pleasure to be here with you all today. And what, what a day to come together to talk about the relationships between the black and Jewish community. Uh, doc, Dr. Rogers, I, I just have to start with you and say what a powerful, thought-provoking, um, well-researched documentary um, you've created. It, I, I've seen many documentaries um, over the years and it, it is so beautifully done. Thank you so much for, for your creation. Um, the, the documentary um, spans so many different aspects, I think, of, um, of the civil rights movement. And it really, really um, points to the, the strong bond and relationship between the black and Jewish community both um, with lay people who were there, um, individuals coming together um, to fight for justice and equity for all people. But there's this real emphasis also, I think, on the connection um, to religion and clergy and how powerful that was. And so doc Dr. Rogers, my question actually is for you. We'll, we'll get started um, with you today. What, what inspired you um, to create this documentary? I just think that uh, you know it's such a pivotal time in our history, and it's so it's so timely. But what was the impetus for you um, to to put this together, and the way you put it together? Well, first of all, thank you so much. What an honor! I always have to like take a deep breath because the making of this film took a long time. But when 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 an esteemed panel like this comes together. I just feel so honored because each panel, I learn so much and I continue to learn. So just thank you so much to New York Jewish Film Festival and to this unbelievable, unbelievable panel. So thank you for that important question. Um, as a Jewish um, woman, I was, I'm from Michigan and I was at the Charles Wright Museum in Detroit, which is an amazing museum and um, Dr. Um, Clarence B. Jones had just written a book many years ago called What Would Martin Say? And he was his personal attorney and draft speech writer and advisor from 1961 to 1968. And one of the chapters in the book was on anti-Semitism. And he specifically spoke about the 24 seven commitment of the Jewish community towards the black led struggle in America. And we developed a friendship. And from that friendship, we decided along with many important people that have been involved in this film, too many to mention, like for sure, uh, Lisa Weitzman and Sherry Frank and Congressman Lewis that helped us raise funds for this movie and Reverend C.T. Vivian and Dr. Heschel and everybody here. It's, it's been a collaborative effort of, of these people coming together to say, it's time to tell the story. That's an American history story and it's recollections of people who lived it. So a lot of this information you might find in some of the books, but some of it you don't have in the books. So like when I was interviewing Reverend C.T. Vivian, he said, no one asked me about witnessing the Jewish, the Jewish people in the civil rights movement. And he was, you know, I spent two days with him and oh my God, what an honor. And so. Thank you so much. Dr. Heschel, um, it's great to see you again. Great to see you so, too. So good to see you. 
And so I, I'd love to get your thoughts and reactions about the, the film overall. You know, I feel like you're in a really unique position. You've had an opportunity to have this um, strong familial connection to the movement. And then the work that you do today is strongly connected to the movement. So I'd love to just get your initial thoughts about the film. Well, I think the film is fantastic and I'm extremely grateful to Sherry Rogers because she worked very, very hard for many years to put this film together. And thank goodness because she was able to interview people who in some cases are not with us any longer. And she made a film, a documentary about this, our relationship that is so important and is to much of my amazement, not known by everyone. I grew up with it, as you say, Yolanda, and I, I was immersed in it. So I had the privilege of meeting many of the great civil rights leaders and the film captures the spirit. And I wanna just emphasize why I think that's so important. You know, nonviolence wasn't simply a matter of if somebody hits me, I don't hit back. Nonviolence was a training that took many, many months and it was about thinking differently. It was about how to think in your mind about the kind of person you wanna be and how you wanna to relate to other human beings. And I have to say that that training of nonviolence changed the spirit of the participants. It changed their souls. And, and the result is when I knew then and to this day, those leaders of the civil rights movement that I've met, you can see that these are special human beings. I can tell you Reverend C.T. Vivian was a holy human being. There was holiness in this person. And the, the way it's expressed also in their warmth and in the gratitude. So yes, my father was involved. That was what, 60 years ago. And yet to this day, all of those leaders express gratitude for my father. Now that's really something extraordinary. And I think there's a lesson for all, all of us, all human beings of what it means to be a person of nonviolence, a person who expresses gratitude. It's a different kind of heart. <sighs> it, it, it is. And you know, I'm really um, glad you brought up the point about um, this not just being something that is based in, uh, I, I turn the other, other cheek and, and then that's, that's nonviolent resistance. This is something very different. And I think this film um, actually brought that out and captured the spirit of what that was like and how, um, how that made the civil rights movement um, successful and something that we use as a model today for how we, um, how we are as activists and how we move through um, this world to fight for what we believe in. So I really, I really appreciate that. Reverend DeGraff, I'd love to get your um, thoughts about, about the film, just in general, the presence of clergy um, was such an integral part, I think, of the civil rights movement. And so I'd love to hear your, th your initial thoughts about it. Well, well, thank you for having me. I, the, I'm struck by the comprehensive nature of the film. Uh, the, the, it's not just, frankly, the usual suspect. Uh, it's a breadth and a depth uh, of a presentation. And it's my privilege to serve as the co-chair for the Attorney General in New York of a Black Jewish Clergy uh, Council Roundtable. And you'd be surprised when people say that people don't know the history. Uh, too many folks have a soundbite understanding of what happened. And, and, and uh, my good friend, Michael Miller, has been a, a legacy person who comes from that era but continues to build bridges. Here's what happens when people are in pain. They tend to shut down, we tend to shut down and make my pain the center of the universe. And yet uh, this film documents in a meaningful way and it should be mandatory in schools across America about the what could be. And, 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 and Yolanda, for me, it takes particular urgency because of January 6th. This would be a tremendous, a, a valuable uh, gift in any circumstances. But after J January 6th, uh, I knew that it was a white supremacist rally, but when I saw 6MWE and Camp Auschwitz shirts, then I knew that something was happening that, that I had to pay attention to. Six million weren't enough. 
And so the same people uh, who were flying the Confederate flag, it, 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 what it means in, in, in my community is what it means in the Jewish community. They, when they marched with six, uh, when they marched and said Jews will not replace us, they were Klansmen without hoods. This is a dangerous time in America. We're standing at a crossroads. And the notion that, that we Americans are choosing to divide ourselves against one another, it is more imperative that we pay attention to this film and the lessons and not to go back to America that is in the past, not to settle for this America right now, but the what could be America. If we could re-explore, rediscover the values, the principles, the faith and the courage of those in that documentary, then that's the pathway out of here. And so uh, I'm delighted to be a privileged person to be in this great number of uh, this VIP group. Uh, but we, this discussion means that when we conclude this afternoon that we've got work to do. Uh, it, it, it's not a Democrat and Republican solution. It's a people solution. And I think we're at the center of it. Thank you so much, Reverend DeGraff. I mean, I, this is the, the humanity of our country and our world is at stake. And I think that um, January 6th just proved that um, we, are, we are at a crossroads and we're at a critical juncture in our history. And if we don't act and act quickly, um, we may find ourselves in a position that we don't wanna be in. And so we have to make sure that everyone sees this documentary because it is so powerful. And although we're talking about something that happened 60 years ago, it's not, it's, it's not far removed from what's happening today. And so um, that's, that's the purpose of us coming together today. You brought up something interesting, Reverend DeGraff, that I want to flag as we move into um, a different um, line of questioning. And it is the, the umbrella of white supremacy. And I wanna read an excerpt actually from um, Eric K. Ward's um, article called Skin in the Game. And, th and this is the excerpt that I want to point out, and then we're going to talk about this a little bit more. It says that anti-Semitism forms the theoretical core of white nationalism. Let me go a little deeper into that um, in his article. So he says, to recognize that anti-Semitism is not a sideshow to racism within white nationalist thought is important for at, at least two reasons. First, it allows us to identify the fuel that white nationalist ideology uses to power its anti-Black racism, its contempt for other people of color, its xenophobia, misogyny, and other forms of hatred that it holds so dear. And so I want to stop at that point um, to talk about the connection between anti-Semitism and racism and what do we do with that today. Now, we all know that I would say in the late 60s, early 70s, that there was a disconnect between the Black and Jewish communities. And so part of why I brought up that article written by Eric K. Ward is that the idea and the notion of white nationalism and white supremacy is basically to divide and conquer and to understand that if they're able to put um, groups like black and Jews um, against one another, that what they are trying to accomplish will be, um, will be easier to accomplish. And so Dr. Heschel, if I could, could start with you um, on this, this question, where do you think the relationship between Blacks and Jews are today? What are some things, some, some strategies, some, some, some ideas that you have that we can rebuild that bridge and um, make sure that connection is strong again, because look at what we're up against. Yeah, what we're up against is something very huge. Uh, and I think uh, what's so horrifying is that we're not getting an attack from, from an enemy outside, but from the enemy within. And that enemy is in fact us. That is, we are living in a country that has never faced up to its actual misdeeds, shall we say. Uh, the this murder of Native Americans when we first got here, and I say we with quotation marks around it, uh, the 
slavery that went on for a couple of hundred years and then was never faced in terms of its racist legacy. I think about racism and the slavery and the, the, the way that our soil of this country is soaking, soaking with the sadism, sadism of the slaveholders and with the pain of those who were enslaved and the legacies that continue in the legal system and the judicial system and the mass incarceration in the inequities. Why do we not have affordable health care? Why do we not have decent education for every single, every single child equally? Schools equally funded. Why don't we have the kind of social security safety nets that any normal country has? Now, why? Because Ultimately, because the racism is so awful in this country that legislators didn't want to give affordable health care to black people so they wouldn't give it to any people. And these are the kinds of issues that we really haven't been talking about sufficiently. People talk about it in college campuses, for example, scholars address it, etc. And there are people on the margins, but the mainstream is only slowly, slowly coming to this discussion. Now, just as an example, we talk about Black Jewish coalition, but of course Jews, quite a few Jews are also black and we have to address the racism of Jews toward Jews. That's also something that hasn't been addressed. We have to also figure out, and I think we need to do it in a public way, where can a black Jew feel comfortable? Which synagogues are gonna be welcoming? Which communities and so forth? And I think we need to make that public so that people will know and know where they stand, their communities stand also and what work they have to do. So I would say in answer to your question, the kind of work we need to do is first of all, the most basic level of each person's community and small net. And then of course, on the highest level of, of our government. But really, uh, I think the crisis is a crisis from within. It's a crisis because we have postponed for too long addressing what we have wrought in this country. Wow, so so powerfully said. And one of the things you brought up, Dr. Heschel, I think that's really important is that this country, this nation has never actually acknowledged its wrongdoings. There's been no truth and reconciliation around um, the genocide of the indigenous community or the enslavement of Africans and internment camps and, 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 and it goes on and on. And until we're able to really do that and see that these things are all intricately linked, that this is a system um, th this is systemic racism. This is a caste system, a hierarchy of, of people who um, are at the top of you know, that caste system. Whiteness is there and then everyone else falls below. Um, we will continue, I think, to grapple with some of the challenges that we have. Um, thank you. Thank you so much for that. Reverend DeGraff, what are you, what are you thinking uh, about um, the role that religion and spirituality can play in helping us bridge these gaps. And uh, understanding that people are not necessarily connecting to religious institutions like churches and synagogues and mosques anymore. What, what are your thoughts about that? And Dr. Well, Heschel, I think you wanna come, we can come back to you if you wanna talk about that. Go ahead, Dr. DeGraff. Well, first I wanna thank Dr. Heschel for her candor uh, because, because she went there I'm gonna, I'm gonna take that baton and say that, that in candor, uh, one of the things that we have to be able to do is to be able to work it out. And, and we fell apart in the civil rights movement because black power and self-determination became uh, umbrellas for a lot of issues. Today, we have issues with BDS and Black Lives Matter, and, and, and we need to be able to work it out because the threat that is against us is, is much greater than what we, is much less than what we have in common. And one of the reasons that Michael Miller and I are dear friends is because we're both men of faith. And in our faith, we're committed to working through difficult moments. It, it's not enough just to be able to say that you have a strong opinion, I have a strong opinion, and I gotta convince you to come to my opinion. People who of faith work it out so that we can go forward together. Uh, and, and where we have come into in America is that it's like we're going to our separate corners and we're going to listen to our favorite cable news or our favorite websites that reinforce whatever our view, views are. 
and, and Dr. Heschel and Martin both, both showed us a bigger picture of, 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 a, of, a, of a picture of what faith in action means. And, and I go back to, we got two ears and one mouth. We ought to listen twice as much as we speak. And, and, and if we're not able to be able to listen and then put ourselves in the shoes of our brothers and sisters from somewhere else, uh, to be able to feel the pain of somewhere else. And, and, and one, of the, one of the challenges uh, that we face is a, is a nearly a linear education system, which reduces history to dates and treaties and, 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 and instead of relationships and interactions. So we need to know about Albert Einstein, who came here just out of the Holocaust and was aghast at what he saw in American racism. And so when Marian Anderson was turned away from residences, uh, hotels, uh, after performing, he opened his home to her and they formed a lifelong friendship. We don't, we go to school every day. We never heard that. We never heard of, of, about uh, Cheney and Schwerner and Goodman. It's not taught in schools. We know it. But we need to know examples of friendship, advanced adv ex examples of working through hard times, working through difficult issues. Because somehow or another, the Proud Boys and, uh, and uh, the Boogaloo Boys, they've worked it out. The Klan has worked it out with the Nazis. They've worked it out. And so if, if, if they can work it out, we serve a bigger God. And that God requires us to work through this moment, to pay attention to what every person in that documentary has had to say, because when we work it out, we produce a change in history. On January 6th, two things happened. The first thing was what you saw on TV, but the other thing, and the thing that will resonate in history was what happened in Georgia. A, a, a black man uh, came from a state that was at the heart of the Confederacy, with a Jewish son of an immigrant and changed the course of American history on the same day, January 6th. So while some of people will want to look at January 6th as a day of infamy, I see a ray of hope that when we get together, no matter what the odds are against us, that when we get together and stay in our faith, that the best is yet to come. Preach it, Reverend. <laughs> <laughs> so true. Oh my goodness. Dr. Heschel, you, you want to respond? Yeah, I, I completely agree with everything uh, that you've just said, Reverend DeGraff. I, I, um, I, I would just say from the point of view of the Jewish community, you had mentioned something about uh, Black nationalism or the late 60s and Broken Alliance, which is the title of a, an excellent book by Jonathan Kaufman. But actually, I first want to say I can understand why there was a black nationalist movement, because after all the women's movement also wanted to have spaces where just women would sit and talk. They were called consciousness raising groups in those days. And I also have to say that that black nationalism actually helped Jews with our Zionism. So in fact, black studies was established at universities and that inspired Jewish students to ask for Jewish studies. So we may have gone in slightly different directions, but they were parallel directions and that's fine. I don't think that was a broken alliance actually or break between us. I think we helped each other and certainly uh, the, the Black Panthers with their very sophisticated uh, social uh, aid groups you know, for taking care of children and providing food and so forth and their intellectual discussions which were highly sophisticated also set an example. Uh, and I, 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 in that sense, I, I worry sometimes when Jews say, oh, well, but, uh, you know, they, they turned away from us. Black community turned away from us. Or we can't, yeah. I don't accept that. Uh, and then I also just want to add, my father said that we forfeit the right to worship God if we don't address our racism. What does it mean? for a racist person to pray? How can a racist person stand before God and pray? So in fact, when we live in a society that's structured as white supremacists with systemic racism, how does that affect our, even our possibility for a really a true religious life? 
Dr. King and my father were important. We know from the Bible that the word of God doesn't come from kings and priests. It comes from prophets. And that's where we have to turn. And that's what they did for us. They gave us the words of the prophets. And hopefully that can go into our hearts. And we can be transformed. So uh, I, I just, uh, just want to say that I, I agree with you completely, Reverend DeGraff. The alliances are extremely important. I think that Sherry Rogers film is a great starting point for a community to start thinking about the past and to be inspired by the past to move forward. I love that photograph of my father marching with Dr. King and the Pettus Bridge in Selma, but I have to say the photograph is not meant to be a pat on the back. That photograph is meant to be a challenge. My father was daring, courageous, and that's what we all need to be. Thank you, thank you so much. Um, and, and I agree, it, it is a challenge for all of us. And I think it's really important for us. And, and Dr. Sherry, if you could talk a little bit about this, um, the role of the individual, right? I mean, um, these were exceptional individuals who came together um, to, to make something happen for everyone. And so while there were many people who stood out and whose names we know, um, there are many, many other people involved in the movement that, um, whose names we don't know. And so I, I wanted to talk to you a little bit about that because I feel like your documentary um, gave us an opportunity to also understand that there were other people involved, including the, the names that we all know. And so if you could speak on that a little bit, and, and, and there's a challenge in that because that means that we don't have to have, um, you know, big names or titles to make a difference. Um, individuals can do it um, on their own. Dr. Rogers. Yeah, thank you. There were, so, there were so many foot soldiers that um, made a difference. I mean, um, that I had interviewed a lot of um, people that were involved, not just because of religious really reasons, but because they were upset that they couldn't fight for their parents when they were in Nazi Germany. So while there, many of the Holocaust survivors were sort of quiet and not really communicating their own personal pain, the children uh, wanted to do something that was, you know, that, that showed that they would have, you know, not been silent in, in Nazi Germany. So one of the amazing people in our film, um, he was one of the SNCC members, um, a Jewish member, and he said he wanted to, you know, knock the Ku Klux Klan out for all the Nazis that killed, you know, the Jewish people. So, and so he, he got involved and he wasn't just in, in Birmingham, he was in Selma, he had guns pointed to his head, one of the other young women who was also involved and is one of the freedom riders that I didn't get to have in the film was in jail for 30 days. I mean, literally in jail for 30 days. And the good news is, is that I'm not doing, I didn't produce this film, you know, for awards or anything. I did it for educational purposes. So we have 80 hours, including Reverend Jack DeGraff, where we're going to make sound bites so that we can hear all the stories of, of the people that you know, were a witness to this history or have something very important to say about this history. And I just wanna add, if we can go back a little bit um, to the prior question. And I also have hope more than I've ever had hope. Um, at the end of our film, Congressman John Lewis, who in many ways was a prophet himself, he said at the time, he said, we are all living in fear. But he has to imagine if Dr. Martin Luther King were alive today and Rabbi Joshua Heschel, they would be pulling together for those generations yet unborn. And I think what I took from it is, is the symbolism behind that they understood that it was that they each had to show up for each other's pain. Well, you can't compare, like Rabbi Fune says in the film, you cannot compare. The, the terrible tragedy, what Blacks experience in America, the J Jewish experience. But Dr. King understood it's the beloved community. So when he was in the Birmingham jail, not only did he write about how angry he was that his children couldn't go to an amusement park, but he also said, I would have broke the legal laws in Nazi Germany 
and stood with my Jewish brothers in, when he was in solitaire. So he understood the importance of having the shared compassion and that we're so much stronger by standing in each other's pain and then activating from it. So I'm hopeful. Um, I come from Detroit and our Congresswoman Brenda Lawrence before our blessed memory Congressman Lewis passed away, she formed the Black Jewish Caucus that is Republican and Democrat that said, you know, we have, we are, we have many differences, but we have more to gain by bringing together our legislators, by bringing together our Congress people and figuring out how we can use what we both know in our communities you know, have, have destroyed us with hate speech and what was built in America, that we have so much more to gain despite our differences by finding common goals. Amen, amen. So um, I, I do know that we have to move to some Q&A with a phenomenal audience. Um, and I see some really interesting questions coming in um, through the chat, but I, I wanna see if we have maybe 30 seconds each just to share some final thoughts um, that, that you would um, wanna share with the audience, any challenges, call to actions, words of wisdom, any, any final things that if nothing else, the audience has a chance to take away what you're going to share with them um, right now. Reverend DeGraff, may I start with you? <laughs> yeah, um, that, that because of where we are in America right now, that I hope that everyone on this call, including all of my distinguished panelists, that each of us standing on that documentary would make a commitment that at the conclusion of this call that we're going to do something. That, that we're gonna get outside of our personal zone of comfort, we all have it, uh, and do something uh, to advance the issue. It could be on an interpersonal relationship, but I know that there are a number of young people on this call, but everybody, can do something. Dr. Yes. yes. So I agree and everyone should do something and there is much to be done. I also think that we have to start thinking differently. So let me just say um, quickly, we talk a lot about white supremacy. We talk about systemic racism. That's a little bit abstract. I want us to think also in concrete terms. I want us to understand what this new, word Afro-pessimism means. What do we mean? What is it, what is the impact of this white supremacy on an individual human being's life? The South African philosopher Tendai Sitholi in his book, The Black Register, talks about anti-blackness as being a denial that a black person is alive so that a police can murder somebody in full view of cameras in public and it's not, and doesn't hesitate. What does that mean? That this person is not viewed as a human being, alive? And does this police act with impunity? So I think we need to consider in very concrete terms with our hearts and our minds, what the impact of racism is. I would also say that at this time, it's so horrible. I, two people in our film, Rabbi Berman's son just, just passed away from COVID and Rabbi and Reverend Gerald Durley's wife just passed away from COVID. This COVID has affected all of us. Yes, it has affected more, more blacks in America than it has affected other people, but we are all in this together. Unless we don't care about each other, we are, we are all going to not have the, the best world that we can have. And that I think after we saw the public lynching of George Floyd, when we couldn't breathe in our own homes, okay, because of COVID and we were stuck, we have now, I'm hopeful because we have more people from all over the world saying enough is enough and that let's use this energy to fight all the people who wanna keep us back and not keeping, keep us move forward. We have enough amazing people that are in this film, that are teachers, that are working together, that we need to, like Reverend Jack said and um, Dr. Heschel, that we need to come together 
and, and move this country forward and harness this energy and this terrible tragedy that so many of us have lost real family members and lives and uh, we can't afford to just sit by and um, you know, we need to breathe and, and, and give other people the freedom to, to be creative, to breathe, to have freedom and we can't sit by anymore. Thank you so much. And so what we've heard is a call to action. Um, I think it was the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. said, if you can't fly, run. If you can't run, walk. If you can't walk, crawl. But by all means, keep moving. And so we have to do that. Um, um, we talked about moving and thinking differently. And I love your, um, the, the phrase, Dr. Heschel, about um, Afro-pessimism and the impact of systemic racism on a community of people. And then Dr. Rogers, this whole idea of a collective and shared humanity is all a part of this. These are all the pillars that we need in order to make a difference in our communities for every single person. And so um, no one is free until we all are free. And we have to keep that in mind. So at, at this time, I will, I will pause here and see if we can start our Q&A with the audience. Thank you all so very much for, for being here and your expertise and your heart and soul um, being devoted to justice and equity for all people. Can you be our moderator in all these panel, panels? You are amazing. <laughs> you are Thank just you so terrific. much. Because not only do you ask the questions, you add so much depth to the conversation. Truly. Thank you so much. It would be an honor. Thank you so much, Yolanda. It really was terrific. We are going to go to audience questions now. Um, the first is, um, their screen name is Jacqueline and Talia Prodian. Can you ask Hi. Um, so the documentary illustrated many areas in common uh, between Black people and Jews, some historical. And as a high school student, I was just wondering what are the most important bridges young people can build today between the two communities? Back to me. I'll take it. Um, uh, the, the, the one bridge is to open your mind. Uh, and by that, uh, to listen, listen to, to many voices. Uh, one, the internet allows us to, to hear many voices, experience many things without having to go to any different place and to open your, your, yourself to, to new voices and new ideas. And when you hear them, the spirit will lead you how to act. Uh, but I would say that over the course of a year, if you could visit another community and make a connection, uh, but it starts with each of us wherever we are. Whenever we get back to school, there's someone in your school who sits in the cafeteria by themselves. And, and go and spend some time with that person. There's someone who is in your neighborhood who could use someone to go shopping for them. In, in other words, what we first, what we have to make a conscientious effort is to stay in touch with our own humanity. And that will open you to a, a set of life experiences. It is, it is vital that we don't just stay in our, in our own little comfort zone and as you see from Dr. Heschel and Dr. King, here's the, 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 the defining characteristic. They got in a fight and they didn't know what the end was gonna be. They, they, they stepped out on faith. And when you do these other things, the, mo the moment will come uh, where you'll be challenged to do something, uh, to say something, and uh, you'll know what to do. And I just wanna add that in the film you see that People had built real relationships. They, they weren't, it wasn't like they showed up for Martin Luther King Day and celebrated, came and went home. All these relationships were built and it takes hard work, just like anything else. If you, when you, when you get a degree in something or when you're working out, it, it's work. And, um, but the, 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 the um, positive feeling you get about helping other communities and, and working together and listening and in the Jewish community, we need the black community now just as much. I mean, this is as, as um, the beautiful person in our film says, this isn't about showing up for each other's poor pathetic souls. We need to be proximate and work together. So 
So, um, and also you're in high school and we have the Spill the Honey Foundation where there's a newsletter where it's gonna be showing like different things where black and Jewish communities throughout the United States are working together and our shared history, what's going on presently and in the past. So I welcome you to come read our newsletters and find out how many wonderful organizations are working together, like the Religious Action Center that has done so much amazing work in the history, the David Goodman Foundation. There are so many amazing groups, the JCRC, that we need more volunteers, learn about what each of these communities are doing and figure out what where you fit in. Thanks so much for that. Next, we're going to go to Amy Niederlander. Am I unmuted? Okay, great. Hi. Um, thank you for allowing me the time to ask the question. Uh, and thank you all for your commitment to this. I've known Sherry for many years and have watched, followed her hard work in making this film happen. And uh, I'm very committed to truth and education. And how can this conversation be brought into the history books and into the curriculum um, in our schools, I understand curriculum is very much influenced by the states. There is federal influence, but there's a movement for this conversation, for truth in our history, for collaboration amongst um, uh, amongst people of different, you know, of different backgrounds and what have you. What can we do? What is happening? How close are we? How far away are we from having this be taught in the schools? Thanks, Amy. She's an uh, amazing friend. And I didn't tell her to come on here like this, but actually we're, we're actually trying to build a curriculum with, um, with the remaining footage and to augment the film um, so that teachers will have um, shorter seven to 10 minute videos with, um, with questions and, and history to, so that people can have more of the nuance rather than just a, a 95 minute film so that, you know, that students can use these and teachers to augment their, um, their American history courses. So, because this is an American history story. All right, next let's go to Joyce Bialik. Hi, the question is really mine, I'm Ezra Bialik. And the film ends with the notion that the Alliance died because civil rights leaders were protesting the treatment of Palestinians. And my question is, you know, the people from the two groups may have different views about the Palestinians, but is that any reason to disrupt the Alliance? The Alliance was doing great work. And is the Palestinian issue something that's worth breaking the alliance over? Well, it's been my, it's been my experience that uh, the polarization has become uh, kind of a, the state of global politics. And uh, alliance building takes hard work and relationship. And the way it's been characterized is that if you believe in Palestinian rights, that you're against the state of Israel and that therefore people have to choose a side. Uh, when you can be for the rights of the Palestinian, of Palestinian people and for the right of Israel to exist. Uh, it's complicated by some of the representatives of Palestinians and their uh, condemnation or the denial of the existence of Israel. But, but our interest as, as human beings can be for both uh, the way I see it. Um, and, and the, but, it has manifested in America in the BDS movement and, and the reaction to it, uh, Black Lives Matter movement and the reaction to it because it's been cast in those terms. But if you, if you keep uh, what we have in common at the center of it, I think we can find a path home. One of the things that uh, Shari's documentary is so uh, critical for us is that many of the people in the film have already gone, left the stage and their first person history. We still have a few remaining. And, and, and the opportunity to learn from their lessons, I think is vital. And that's why this documentary is so important. 
right now, I think as Americans, together we can find a way and work a path together. There are always going to be folks who take extreme or exclusionary points of view. But if we want to move forward together, then we have to be committed to that effort. So I'd like to respond as well, uh, if I may. Uh, first of all, I think it was Bernice Reagan who said, if all of your allies are in agreement with you, it's not an alliance. Uh, so the idea that we turn away from people who disagree with us is a big problem. I would even call it a grave sin. Uh, and I think uh, in some ways I can see fault on, on both sides, distrust and anger, resentment. One of the crucial things in bringing about social change is to be careful not to allow resentment to enter our hearts because then really nothing will take place. We can't go forward. And so uh, we need to cultivate ourselves. And this comes back to the questions, a couple of questions that were raised about education. First of all, while I would love to see this history taught in the schools, I also know that that might take a long time to happen. And in the meanwhile, we should remember that there are many places where we learn things. There are public libraries, there are churches, synagogues, mosques, there are community centers, and there are our own homes. We can sit with kids, with relatives, with friends, with neighbors, and watch this film and talk about it and read books and have discussions about them. So uh, we don't have to depend on a school curriculum mandated by the state. But I also want to say as a professor at a university that I feel that our kids in high school are, are suffering and being forced to suffer in ways that I find very disturbing. They're cramming everything in. They're trying to stuff their brains so that they can pass exams and get into college, et cetera. I think we pay a lot of attention to the mind. And of course, I appreciate that as a professor, but we need balance. So there's a lot of emphasis on the body on sports, and many schools on art, not enough, but there's something else that needs to be cultivated for a kid in high school. And that's the heart. How do we cultivate the heart to open it, to be sensitive? to understand other people, to be empathic and to be compassionate. That's also something that needs to happen. I would say at homes, in religious houses of worship, but also even in the schools, can we do that too? Because ultimately the importance of this film, it's about an alliance, an alliance between people who had the kinds of hearts that could be open to one another. And that's really foundationally what we need. And especially at this time. And then just a final word. One of the things that anti-Semitism does and racism does is create tension within the community. The polarization within the Jewish community today, that's also an effect of anti-Semitism that's just bursting. And so too in this country, we have to attend to that. And we have to see that by maintaining the polarization, we're giving strength to the anti-Semites, for example. So let's be careful and let's be wise in how we approach these issues. Thank you. Dr. Heschel, based on what you just said, can you please um, go into detail a little bit more? Because I think it's such an important lesson that you talk about with the Rebbe and what he said um, and your father said about pain. Sure. Um, and actually this week in the synagogue, we're reading uh, the Parsha's called Bo. It's Bo El Paro. It's chapter 10 of Exodus where God tells Moses, go to Pharaoh. Go to Pharaoh because I have hardened his heart. Well, in Hasidic understanding, what does that mean? Go, to go to Pharaoh is a very dangerous thing. But why should Moses go? The way the Hasidic understanding of it is God goes with Moses. God descends with Moses to this frightening place to lift Pharaoh out, to change his heart. My father had an ancestor, the Abder Rav, a Hasidic Rebbe, who was a very warm and loving person. And people came to him dozens and dozens every day to ask for a blessing and to tell him about their problems. They had a sick relative. They didn't have a job, what to do and they would pour out their troubles. 
And one day his assistant asked the Rebbe, how do you remember all of these people? They ask you to pray for them. And he said, when someone comes to me and they tell me their troubles, I open my heart and their heart, their troubles go in my heart and they make a scar. And when I go to pray, I open my heart to God and I say, look at all these scars. And I think what's important about that is the idea that we each, each one of us wants to be able to talk to someone who will listen to us in that way. And we all, I am sure, strive to be the kind of person who listens in that way with that kind of heart. And I would say that's what I meant when I said that the alliance was based on these hearts coming together. And so we need to know the history, of course, we need to be inspired by it, we need to get to work, and we also have to be sure to cultivate our hearts. And I, yeah. Thank you so much. And thank you so much to all of our panelists and our moderator for this session. It really was really special. And I appreciated hearing from all of you. Um, Cinematters continues this afternoon with two more really terrific panels. Um, one on the film Black Boys at 4 p.m. And uh, our closing event, uh, Q&A on John Lewis, Good Trouble at 6 p.m. And just as a reminder, for those of you who haven't yet had a chance to see Shared Legacies, you can watch it until midnight tonight. And tickets can be found um, at cinematters.film. Um, please follow us on Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook at Lights, Camera, Action, Take Action, and Cinematters 2021. Aviva, do you want to close us out with some information on the New York Jewish Film Festival's events coming up? Sure. I first just want to thank all the speakers for the, the very moving and inspiring words, especially at a time when it can be so easy to um, slide into hopelessness. Um, on the important theme of social justice, I'd like to just mention the Jewish Museum's current exhibition, We Fight to Build a Free World, an exhibition by Jonathan Horowitz on view through February 7th. And there's info and a virtual tour at thejewishmuseum.org. And the New York Jewish Film Festival continues through January 26th, info at nyjff.org. Thank you so much. It's been great partnering with the JCC and the Cinematters New York Social Justice Film Festival. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank Have you. a great afternoon.